So with that, uh, we enter into uh, the more specialistic part of uh, um, our workshop uh, with uh, uh, a, a scientific introduction by uh, Carlo Massimo Casciola, who uh, is uh, now uh, ready for um, giving uh, his talk. Carlo, whenever you're ready, please, um, your stage is yours. Th thank you, Alberto, for, for the introduction. I'm ready. Just trying to, to put things full screen. So, uh, hope you see my, my screen now. Are you ready? Please. Yeah. Th thank you, Alberto, for, for the introduction. I'm ready. Just trying to, to put things full screen. So, okay. Uh, so, so here it is. Um, well, uh, good afternoon to everybody. And, uh, yeah, there seems to be problems with the... Carlo, uh, perhaps you have to close Ibrida, the platform. Uh, yeah, I can or, or mute it. And, uh, yeah, there seems to be problems. Okay, here it is, found. Hopefully now it's solved, right? Yes, much better, thanks. Okay, okay, sorry about that. So, as I said, let me go back to, to full screen mode. So hopefully now uh, you should see my full screen. Do you? Hello? Yes, we do see it. You do see it. Perfect. Okay, so great. So as I said, good afternoon to everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to speak to all of you. So regionally, uh, uh, Giovanni Cicotti was expected to deliver this uh, introductory talk, but uh, unfortunately for a personal reason, he couldn't be uh, present online today. So we do advance I was advised for that. So we decided to sort of interact together in planning this, uh, this, this short talk, uh, through which I will try to touch upon a certain uh, subject that for sure will be uh, treated in more, uh, much more detail by the successive technical speakers. So what is the scope of the, of the workshop? The, the workshop uh, aims at putting uh, together uh, scientists which are complementary in expertise in the field of uh, uh, ionic, channel, ionic channels and, and nanopowers. Uh, this complementarity mm, happens due to different things. So the, 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 they will have, uh, there will be uh, experience, uh, expertise in, in experiments, simulation and theory. This is one uh, form of complementarity. And then a certain kind of application will involve biological matter. Other ones will deal with inorganic nanobots, for instance. And also we will have uh, contribution which aims at explaining, at developing methodologies and other ones with, uh, mostly involved with specific applications. So all those fields are sort of tied together in the sense that uh, uh, the progress in each one of those fields uh, fosters the progress in complementary fields. However, often it may happen that the certain barriers hamper the osmosis between the different fields due to uh, uh, different languages that are adopted by the different communities and a deeply technical aspect that may be not familiar to everybody. Okay, so let, let me start with, uh, with a, a few historical notes. So in, in, in 1963, a Nobel Prize was awarded to Hodgkin and Astley for uh, uh, investigating and understanding certain ionic mechanisms that were involved in the excitation and inhibition of uh, nerve cells in the membrane. 
Uh, here, what you see is a mathematical uh, model, which is known as the origin arc play model, which sort of uh, uh, reproduce uh, the, 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 the voltage across the membrane. So it is a system of four ordinary partial differential equations. Successively, in 91, another Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, Medicine was awarded to Neher and Sackman for developing a, a, a central, a crucial technique, which is known as patch clamping, that allowed to uh, obtain much cleaner results about the uh, current recordings uh, in, in the in the uh, membrane patches of cells on on on, on from from the uh, cell itself. In the new century, at the beginning of, of the new century, another Nobel Prize was awarded awarded to McKinnon and Agri for discoveries concerning uh, channels in cell membranes, both ionic channels or, or and aquaporins. Uh, simultaneously, in parallel with that. Recently, there have been a, a, a big development in technologies. And for instance, what you see here are sketches uh, explaining the fabrication techniques for solid state nanopores by drilling a, a, a nanometric hole in, into a silicon uh, uh, membrane. In parallel with technological and experimental techniques, uh, there have been developments in, in, in computer simulations. So this is a, a, a slide that uh, I didn't discuss together with Giovanni for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, what I'm showing is a book from Giovanni and, and co-workers in which they uh, present a, 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 an history, a sequence of events that uh, uh, happened during the, the last part, second half of the last century from the start of the computer era in the late 40s and the 50s up to the 90s, when computer simulation, in particular uh, atomistic simulation, uh, reached uh, maturity. Of course, uh, these techniques are still improving today, and we will see important contributions in this line during the workshop. What you see here highlighted in red marks the years around the 75, in which the first attempt to uh, simulate biologically relevant systems started to take place. Many years later, in 2013, a Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Levitt, Karpus and Warshall. And what you see is an excerpt taken from uh, the nature uh, issue of that period, where they explain the nature, uh, the reason for awarding this Nobel Prize and then and a nice thing is the last sentence in which the, the author, Van Norton, says they took the chemical experiment to the cyberspace. Okay, this was uh, the, 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 the uh, overall background. Now, when you are dealing with uh, 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 cellular membranes, you, uh, this, this membrane uh, separates two aqueous environments. So what is important? So what I was trying to show here without entering into the mathematical details of that is a recent work coming from the group of, uh, of the LAGO where they uh, proposed a very interesting model to explain nucleation in a bulk liquid. This was probably the first time in which purely theoretical efforts, efforts merging together microscopic and mesoscopic uh, theories uh, were able to predict reasonable values for the nucleation time, if you, if you could call that, or more precisely, the escape rate from the well, which uh, uh, is part of the free energy profile for, for a bubble forming in the, in the bulk liquid. But of course, when we deal with uh, uh, nanopores, uh, there is a, a strong uh, geometrical confinement. So those kind of theories cannot predict accurately what happens when, say, an hydrophobic nanopore is getting dried. For that, what you need from a theoretical and computational point of view 
is the use of atomistic methods in which you follow the dynamics of the different molecules. Uh, here you see a, a, a picture uh, taken from a simulation in which you see uh, water molecules inside a model nanopore, which is the greenish part that you see in the figure, in which you see that the sort of bubble is forming in the middle of the nanopore, such that the drying process is beginning here. For doing that, you need certain kind of uh, specialized numerical techniques that I will touch upon in a second. What I'm showing here is a sequence of the configuration of the coarse grain density field of water inside the nanopore, starting from the, na the nanopore, which is completely filled with water. And then you see a bubble forming near the middle on one side of the nanopore, and then the bubble expands, touches the opposite side of the nanobore. This is the transition state. And then the bubble keeps expanding until all the water in inside the nanobore is expelled. Sono le ore 15. For doing that, you need uh, atomistic simulation. So molecular dynamics, for instance. I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, we're not to say that I'm calling Q and P here uh, as often. Uh, position and momenta of the particle. Now, when you deal with this system, you always have to face the problem of uh, having very huge uh, nucleation barrier. Uh, what is shown here is, 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 is a visualization of something which is called a collective variable. So it is a variable that sort of singles out a, a collection of microstates for which that collective variable shares the same value. In this example, it is the number of water molecules inside the region, which is highlighted in, in yellow. And then what you want to uh, have access to is the probability distribution function for the values of this variable. The logarithm of that is the free energy or Landau free energy of the process. And one of the purpose of many of the simulations is to extract these uh, free energy profiles, and in particular, to evaluate the free energy barrier that separates two different metastable states. This raises the question, the issue of relevance. So what you see in this cartoon is a researcher in the field of atomistic simulation and rare event techniques, was trying to climb the hill up to the top of the free energy barrier. You will recognize from here uh, the, 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 the character here, which is, which is a cartoon of Giovanni Cicotti. This is another slide that was not discussed with him, so he is not aware that I'm using this, this, this cartoon. And now, once on a while, very rarely, once on a blue moon, the researcher is able to find out an algorithm which is able to bring him on top of the free energy barrier. Now, going through the different uh, abstracts uh, of the workshop, I, I, will, uh, I found mentioned several times this technique which is known as restrained molecular dynamics, which basically means that what we want to do is to do a simulation with tends to restrain the system around certain target values for the relevant corrective variable. This is done by biasing the system with the potential which restrains the system around the target. And it can be shown theoretically that in the appropriate limit from the mean force, you can extract the gradient of the free energy profile, which, is, which can then be recovered by integration. Uh, the thing can get more complex, and you may want, for instance, to recover the mean free energy path connecting two metastable states. And this can be done, for instance, using this uh, string method, which is uh, illustrated here uh, graphically, basically. There are equations, but, but there is no time to enter into that. Of course, many of you know what is behind this, this approach in, in, in great detail. Now, up to now, we have focused on the 
issue of rare events. This is the, not the entire story. Uh, what we want to do is to solve equations of a large number of particles using classical mechanics. And for that, we need force, interaction forces. Uh, a, a, a big breakthrough was obtained by Carl and Parinello, who developed a, a strategy to evaluate the interaction force using uh, quantum mechanics density functional theory, actually, in order to evaluate the interaction force between the uh, atoms, the nuclei of the atoms, accounting for the uh, effect of the electrons. Uh, this, this technique is, is very accurate. Unfortunately, it is extremely expensive. So, uh, there is need for something else. Hmm? The straightforward choice would be to try some uh, functional form for these uh, potentials and feed those potentials to the data. This would give very fast procedures. However, there is poor control on the accuracy. So, the recent trend in this area uh, is to develop interpolation techniques for systems which live in a usually dimensional phase space, and then is done using, using uh, modern machine learning techniques. This leads to fast algorithms with controlled accuracy. I know that there will be important contribution during the workshop, next talk in particular, concerning aspect related machine learning. Then you could use uh, mesoscopic modeling like classical density functional theory, LUSCO, the Octobi and Evans, uh, Tarzona, or dissipated particle dy dynamics. For instance, you find a very interesting review in the paper by Espan Espanol and Warren. Now let's go to experiment. This is a very nice experiment in which the author succeeded in pushing the fluid through a carbon nanotube. What they found is basically that the flow rate was much larger than expected. And the interesting part uh, here from a theoretical, the theoretical side is that they do not have access to directly measuring the flow rate. Instead, what they do, they measure the motion induced in the environmental fluid in which the, the nanojet is discharging, evaluate the velocity field over there, and using a theoretical solution from Squires and Landau, they are able to relate what they measure at the microscopic level to the flow rate or the, the momentum flux actually, which is exiting from the carbon nanotube. So this is a nice example of interaction between theory and experiment at different scales. Then things with uh, several membranes involves uh, uh, ionic currents. And this is what we have here is, is, is a sketch uh, in which you see, uh, uh, in principle, uh, how the gating currents can be measured. So what you have is a protein, which are a charged portion or polar portion. And then by applying and controlling external fields, you can induce the motion of this of these charged portions of polarized regions, and that can be measured in the form of a current, which is the gating current. So the sketch is quite uh, simple to understand and explain. Of course, the technique is quite, is quite complicated and delicate. However, it, it offers unprecedented precision in measuring these uh, gating currents. This is another example dealing with uh, solid state nanopores. This is a very interesting approach in, in which graphene nano ribbons are combined in order to simultaneously measure the current to the graphene and the, and the voltage across the nanotube, which is occupied by a translocating DNA molecule. Now, up to now, we have been considering a really small scale single uh, uh, elements of the process. In several membranes, there are many ionic uh, channels working simultaneously but you can also grow up in size to reach microscopic systems. The sketch here shows intrusion extrusion experiments in which a piston pushes water inside a suspended uh, uh, grain sands, which are nanoporous. What happens here is that these nanopores are hydrophobic. 
So there is uh, a resistance to intrusion, and depending on the size and the conformation of those uh, nanopores, you may obtain quite different results. On one side, you may have systems in which you have used huge hysteresis loops, like in the case on the left. This will lead to a material which in microscopic term is able to dissipate an enormous amount of energy per unit mass of the material. To the opposite side, what we have is that the, uh, if the nanopores get uh, smaller and smaller, you reach a critical size after which this, uh, this dissipated behavior disappears, and you are dealing with a purely conservative system which can store energy and release it with uh, almost negligible losses. Uh, there will be talks concerning this, so technological application in different fields like shock absorbers or energy applications in which you combine, you, you, you couple this, this, uh, this nanopores and this intrusion extrusion mechanism with, with the heat fluxes, for instance, or diffusion fluxes of different species to obtain a uh, very important uh, uh, microscopic effect which can be exploited in actual technological applications. This is an example of how to use uh, uh, radio wave techniques and molecular uh, combine it with uh, molecular dynamics in order to uh, evaluate the sides of these uh, uh, hysteresis loops. So, in conclusion, I see that my time is almost over. What I'm showing here uh, is a table in which I'm reporting the number of contribution that we are going to have in the workshop in the different fields from simulation to experiments. So you see that, uh, I mean, the actual organizers of the, of the workshop did the, a, a great job in balancing very well the different contributions in order to allow a, a direct discussion between the different approaches that may be taken in studying uh, ionic uh, uh, channels and nanopores. So, to reach the conclusions, I would say that the aim of the workshop would be to try to uh, reach a synthesis between simulation and theory and experiments. So, on one side, we know that uh, uh, experiments advance often driven by theoretical input. In other conditions, Novel experimental techniques sort of produce what are called here privileged observable. By privilege, I mean something that you are able to measure with big precision and reproducibility, sometimes with these particular observables, we do not uh, immediately understand and know what are the, the physical interpretation of them. So what is the role of simulation and theory in this case? But theory is basically a corpus of rules from which we should calculate consequences. And the target would be to predict the values of the observables, and in particular, to learn how to describe and understand what are called here as privileged observables. So there is a synergy between experiments, theory, and simulations, and I'm sure that this is not going to be so clear, so I want to conclude with an example taken from the history of our field, in a sense. So this is a paradigmatic example in which you see the comparison between, you see the comparison between uh, the experimental values for the structure function, factor, sorry, of, of, of liquid sodium near melting compared with atomistic simulation. So the interesting aspect here is the fact that what you measure is something which is technically called the intermediate scattering function. And immediately it's not so clear what it does means from the physical or atomistic point of view. Of course, if you develop the theory, uh, you end up, or actually Van Oven went, uh, Van Oven, uh, went up with the definition of this correlation function which directly connects the dynamic structure function to something which is related to the density distribution into the, into the microscopic system, which is something that nowadays 
with a present day computer we can calculate. So to conclude, I would say that too often mm -hmm. in a conference, one is looking for his own specific research interest. This is not the aim of the present uh, workshop. Actually, the aim of the workshop is, this year is the opposite. And it is to stimulate the curiosity for the neighboring field in order to induce this osmosis, which is sort of prevented by barriers, which, as I said, are really often to different um, technicalities and different languages, which are used by the different uh, sub communities, which cooperate to the same overall goal of understanding a certain piece of physics. With that, uh, I wish you a good and inspiring workshop to everybody, and thank you for listening. Carlo, thank you very much for this nice overview of the main scientific topics that will be discussed uh, during the workshop, but also for laying down, so to say, the route to, towards our discussion today. I think you interpreted uh, the philosophy of the workshop much better than uh, what uh, us, direct organizer, would have done. Uh, so um, I don't uh, see any urgent question from the audience, but I, I think your conclusions were very inspiring and will uh, uh, help us uh, during this workshop to um, drive our uh, discussion and inspire our curiosity.